I'm going to begin this morning with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into uh, our short little passage, our short little verse that we're going to be reading today. Heavenly Father, we are so, so, so thankful that uh, you have all of us here. Lord. It's really mind-boggling, you know, uh, how you do things, the way you purpose them, the way you arrange things. Last week it was just the men, and this this week we majority female, Lord, and you know, it's just you're so. We know that you're here, Lord. Your word says where two or three are gathered together, there you are as well. And so we know you're here with us. And so I just pray that you will move mightily, Lord. I pray that hearts will be open right now, that any anger, any pride, any, any sin, Lord, will just be confessed and removed, Lord. And, and that right now, our hearts will be soft to receive your word. Lord, and may you just be there and be implanted there, Lord, so that eventually it bears fruit. I pray that you will change lives this morning, you will change relationships. And you will just ultimately just do radical work in people's lives, Lord. We look forward to hearing what you have to say now, Lord, through your word and through this message. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you have your Bibles open or you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 1. And we're going to be reading verses 5 and the first half of verse 6. Matthew chapter 1, verse 5. And the Word of God says, Salmon fathered Boaz by Rahab. Boaz fathered Obed by Ruth. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered King David. Now there's one name there in particular that I want you to pay attention to. And that name will be the focus of our attention here for the next few weeks as we get into this new book in the Old Testament, um, as we study it chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And that's going to be the book of Ruth. Have you ever heard the phrase, pay it forward? That phrase, it espouses an unselfish, unselfish, others-oriented virtue that resonates with the biblical teachings that we're to love God, neighbor, and foreigner, and that those and that in serving those in need, we serve the Lord Jesus Himself. Well, the book of Ruth presents an illustration of such virtue that also offers a window into the synergy between human and divine purposes. It further constitutes an inspirational reminder that the Lord often, He has greater plans for our actions than what we'll see in our earthly lifetimes. Now, besides this book, as many of you know, there's one other book named after a woman, Esther. The book of Esther. Now, what's noteworthy is that one was a Jewish girl who married a prominent Gentile, and that was Esther and, and King uh, Ahasuerus. Sorry. And the other was a Gentile woman who married a prominent Hebrew, Ruth and Boaz. Now, another significant thing about these two women. Uh, what they have in common is that they both were part of God's redemptive history. The story of Ruth begins with a famine and ends with the birth of a baby, while the story of Esther begins with a feast and ends 
with the death of over 75,000 people. God is mentioned 25 times in the book of Ruth, but he's not named even once in the book of Esther. Yet, in both books, the will of God is fulfilled and the providential hand of God is clearly seen. Now, in this book, the plot revolves around one big major problem, namely that of Noemi's empty and bitter life. Everything else that happens in the book is tied to the development and resolution of this particular problem. Naomi's life is stricken by tragedy at the outset of the story. The loss of her husband and sons while living in a foreign land resulted not only in, in a personal anguish, but in poverty and hardship in her old age. The characters that appear and events that follow lead to a reversal of that tragedy. In the course of those events, the character of Ruth stands out. And for this reason, the book is quite appropriately named after her. So this little story, the story in this little book will show us the beautiful relationship between our human responsibility to live God-honoring lives, doing good for one another, and God's transcendent plans being worked out, whether we're conscious of it or not. You see, sometimes it's only in hindsight that we're able to gain a perspective like that of the Apostle Paul when he wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, I worked harder than any of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Now let's get into some information about this book. And let's begin with the, some background and, and, and setting. The book of Ruth is named after the Moabitess um, who had married a Hebrew man living in Moab. After the death of her husband, Ruth migrated with Naomi, her widowed Hebrew mother-in-law, to Bethlehem in Israel. There, God providentially provided for her and led her to marry Boaz, a prosperous Hebrew farmer. Ruth became the great grandmother of King David. And actually in the verse we just read, this at the beginning, Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, she's actually listed in the genealogy of Jesus. Now in regards to authorship, no one really knows for sure who wrote the book of Ruth. Jewish tradition has Attributed, it, attributed the book to Samuel. Now, if he was the author, the book would have been written near the time when David was anointed king of Israel. One of the reasons then for Samuel's writing the book of Ruth could have been to justify David's claim to the throne. Now, when the book was written, it's even harder to say. The inclusion of David in the genealogy points to the fact that it wasn't written until after David was king. But how long after David was king? Well, some have suggested the early days of the monarchy in Israel, or near the time when the monarchy was divided. Others have suggested that Ruth was written after the exile in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. Now, according to verse 1, the book of Ruth is set during the time of Judges, a period of social and religious disorder when, as Judges chapter 17, verse 6 puts it, everyone did 
whatever seemed right to him. Historically, this era bridged the time between the conquest of the land under Joshua and the rise of King David, whose family record, records form the conclusion of this book. Now, it isn't clear exactly when in the timeline uh, the book begins, but it opens with a famine in the land, which may have been the result of Israel's idolatry. Let me now share with you some themes that, some themes that we're going to be seeing in this book and the purpose it was written. Now, this book was written from Naomi's point of view. All events related back to her. Her husband's and son's death, her daughter-in-law, her return to Bethlehem, her God, her relative, Boaz, her land to sell, and her descendants. So in a sense, this story views God through the eyes of a woman. Think about that. This story here views God through the eyes of a woman. Furthermore, Naomi has been compared to a female Job. She lost it all. Home, husband, and sons, and even more than Job did, her livelihood. She became part of Israel's lowest members, the poor and the widowed. She cried out in her grief and neglected to see the gift God, that God had placed in her path, which was Ruth. Now, Ruth herself embodied loyal love. Her moving vow of loyalty that we're going to be seeing in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, it's often included in modern wedding ceremonies to communicate the deep devotion that new couples, they, what they aspire to, to achieve. The book reveals the extent of God's grace. He accepted Ruth into his, uh, into his chosen people and honored her with a role in, the continuing, in continuing the family line into which his appointed king, David, and later his son, Jesus, would be born. Now, several themes are going to appear here in this book. I'll give you just a few. First of all, grace. Naomi thought that the Lord's hand of, ju of judgment was upon her after she and her husband left the promised land in search of food and married their sons to, a Moabite, to Moabite women in search of of offspring, she underestimated God's grace. Her daughter-in-law, Ruth, the Moabitess, turned out to be the means by which the Lord would meet her needs for food and offspring to carry on the family name. Ruth's choice of a place to glean, which seemed to be a matter of chance turned out to be a divine appointment with Boaz, the man who would fulfill the role of family redeemer for Naomi and Ruth. Now it's interesting too that this book somewhat resembles the parable of the lost son in Luke chapter 15 and in a couple ways. The family of Elimelech wandered away from the land where the Lord had promised to bless his people in search of fullness. As a result, however, Naomi ended up empty and alone. 
Yet the Lord's judgment on her was designed to bring her back home, to replace her emptiness with a new fullness. Similarly, the book of Ruth opens with the Lord's people experiencing the trials of the days of the judges when general disobedience led to famine. Yet the Lord again, His grace, the Lord graciously provided food for His hungry people and a king to meet their needs for leadership. These are the lessons that speak to us as well, especially when we walked away from the Lord and need to receive His grace and His mercy. Another theme, second theme, God's providence. The family records of David at the end of the book show that the Lord worked through this story to provide for his people's need for a king. Even though the Lord's action are mainly, mainly concealed, there are two specific events attributed directly to him, providing food for his people in chapter 1, and the conception for Ruth in chapter 4. In these ways, the Lord provided for all of His people's needs. Another theme in this book is faithful love. The book of Ruth demonstrates how the Lord shows His covenant faithfulness to His undeserving people, often in surprising ways. In the course of the story, each of the main characters proved to be a person of extraordinary courage and covenant love. They're people whose spiritual commitment, this is a topic I spoke about last week, spiritual commitment is demonstrated clear, clearly in godly living. A fourth theme, the family redeemer. The book of Ruth provides a great example of a family member who used his power under Jewish law to redeem. Boaz demonstrated one of his duties of the family member, that of marrying the widow of a deceased family member. A correlation is sometimes made between the redemption of Ruth by Boaz and the redemption of sinners by Christ. See, because of God's covenant faithfulness, He has provided a Redeemer that we all need in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the true King toward uh, whom the family records of David will ultimately extend. And He is the Redeemer in whom His wandering people find rest. In Him, the Gentiles, meaning us, we're too, the Gentiles too are incorporated into the people of God by faith and are granted a place in the family of promise. Now, the purpose of Ruth, of this book, isn't simply to provide us with information concerning the genealogy of David. This is, as you read this book, this isn't really a story. Well, it kind of is, but um, it's not really a story about that uh, genealogy, information concerning the genealogy of David. Rather, the purpose of Ruth is to present within the genealogy of David a positive case study for an anatomy of faith. For example, those crucial moments when faith is tested, the much longer period of perseverance in faith, 
and the rewards for such that God may extend in this life. Moreover, the book also shows faithful obedience. You see, my friends, obedience in everyday life, it pleases God. When we, as His children, as His people, reflect His character through our interactions with others, with those at your work, at your school, in your community, We obey Him. And when we reflect His character through those times we meet up with others, we we bring glory to Him. We bring glory to Him. Ruth's sacrifice and hard work to provide for Naomi reflected God's love. Boaz's loyalty to his kinsmen, Naomi's husband, reflected God's faithfulness. <coughs> Naomi's plan for Ruth's future reflected selfless love. Let me, let me mention that again because you're going to be seeing that as we go through this book. Ruth's sacrifice and hard work to provide for Naomi reflected God's love. Boaz's loyalty to his kinsmen Naomi's husband reflected God's faithfulness. Naomi's plan for Ruth's future reflected selfless love. (coughs) This showed the Israelites the blessings that obedience could bring. It showed them the loving, faithful nature of their God. This book demonstrates that God responds to His people's cry. He practices what He preaches, so to speak. Watching Him provide for Naomi and Ruth, two widows with little prospects for a future, we learn that He cares for, yes, He cares. God cares for society's outcasts just as He asks us to do. So, now, what is the message of this book? And how is it relevant to us? Although, again, the message of this book could be seen as an affirmation of King David's right to the throne of Israel, the truth of the book for all ages, back then, now, and the future, it might be stated in the following way. I guess you can say it, you know, the the truth of this book. The Lord is faithful in uh, in His business of loving, superintending, and providentially caring for His people. Again, let me repeat that. The Lord is faithful in His business of loving, superintending, and providentially caring for His people. God's people, us Christians, we should also be about His business in the ordinary activities of life. Since God's people are recipients of His grace, They, us, like Ruth and Boaz, should respond in faithful obedience to Him and in gracious acts towards other people during a period of great irresponsibility in Israel's history. The book of Ruth was a clear call for responsible living. Clearly, This is a message that we need, that we still need today. In a place right now, in a country or the world we live in right now where it's just a lot of irresponsibility, it's books like this 
that call for responsible living. Also, Boaz acted in grace to redeem Ruth. Christ acted in grace by giving himself as the Redeemer to provide redemption for all mankind. Not just a select few, for all mankind. I'll get into that in a second, but I want to share with you some, some principles that we're going to see here in this, in this book. And these are just mention some words here and you'll find them or you'll hear about them as we go through uh, this entire book. But here's some principles. Loyalty, honor, wisdom, blessing, reversal and redemption. What do I mean by that? Naomi's loss and then fulfillment shows her situation is reversed and then tied to the idea of reversal, uh, and that is redemption. What would have been lost is rightfully reclaimed. What would have been wasted, it ends up bearing fruit. And one last principle, human and divine cooperation. Now, as we go through this book, the sovereignty of our great God will clearly be seen. You see, He will guide her. He will guide her every step of the way to become His child and fulfill His plan for her to become an ancestor of Jesus Christ. Likewise, we have an assurance that God has a plan for each and every one of us. Just as Naomi and Ruth trusted him to provide for them, so should we. If you wake up in the morning and asking yourself, man, those gas prices have really gone up. Those utility bills have really skyrocketed. How am I going to pay? How am I going to make it another day? Trust in the Lord. He has a way. He has a purpose. I, I don't know how he's going to do it. I can't say. But he will provide for you. Trust in him. We will see Ruth, an example of the virtuous woman of Proverbs 31. See, in addition to being devoted to her family and faithfully dependent upon God, we will see Ruth as a woman of godly speech. Her words are loving, kind, and respectful, both to Naomi and Boaz. Now, according to that proverb, Proverbs 31, the virtuous woman of Proverbs 31, uh, verse 26, it says, Her mouth speaks wisdom, and loving instruction is on her tongue. We could search far and wide to find a woman today as worthy of being our role model being our role model as Ruth. Those of you women who have gone through this book, have understand, have done a study on Proverbs 31. Again, I, I understand, I realize, you know, those are pretty big goals to, to achieve, to be that kind of woman. You almost, it's almost, you almost have to be perfect to do all those things. But are you striving to meet as many of those virtues as you possibly can? No. 
what is found in your heart, what is found coming from your mouth, what is found in your heart, what kind of behaviors do you have towards your parents, your children, your husband, my wife knows that, you know, as long as I, you know, before I go to work at night, as long as I have my cup of juice, you know, I mean, that's, for me, that's, I look at her and she's a virtuous woman just by doing that. Um, but no, I mean, she, you know, I, I don't expect her to be that perf, you know, perfect woman there that's found in that proverb, but, you know, she does. She blesses me in so many ways. You don't have to be married to show those virtues that are found there, but again, you can try to meet some of them or work on them. And our world today, our society today, needs women like that. Especially in a society where People have a hard time defining what a woman is. I'm not going to get all into the subject, into that topic, because it could go long, I could go on a rabbit trail. But we need women just as much as we need men leaders, good, godly, Christ, Christian um, leaders in the home and in the community and our government. We need women, too, that are going to be um, role models in our society, two young women. So many of you know, our young women today are being influenced so many things and so many people when it should be us. It should be their parents. It should be their parents and Especially if they're girls, they should be looking at their mothers as, man, she's a good role model. Now, there are five applications here in this entire book that I think that we'll be able to, to learn and to, to apply into our daily lives. And that's my hope and prayer that you will see them as we go through this book and that you will apply them, that you will actually apply them. First of all, God is concerned about all people, regardless of race, nationality, or status. Ruth wasn't a Jew. She was a Moabite. Even though many discriminated against her, God loved her just the same. So that shows us that God doesn't discriminate. He loves all people just the same. He loves you regardless of, even if you know, you're being discriminated against right now, you have a God that doesn't. He loves you and cares for you and He just sees you as His child. Number two, another application, men and women, men and women are both equally important to God. Yes, God cares about men and women all the same. See, we're all special. We're all one in His eyes. Yes, we're individual, we're His individual children, but... He doesn't see us and, and say, you know what, that guy is better than her because, you know, just because. No, he cares about us. He cares about you. He cares about me. While most false religions that have been constructed over the centuries often elevate men and 
dishonor women. Christianity is the one religion that consistently honors men and women in the same level. So again, there is no difference in his eyes. Now, the roles and responsibilities of men and women are clearly stated in his word, in God's word, in the Bible. But in regards to love, in regards to care, in regards to, you know, there is no greater. He doesn't care more about men than he does women. You know, he doesn't care about those things. He doesn't look at those things. Another application. There's no such thing as an, as an unimportant person in God's eyes. Now, at the surface level, few saw Ruth as an important person. She was from Moab. I don't know if you know the history of those people and how they came to be. Well, that nation, that was a nation that originated from an incestuous encounter between Lot and one of his daughters. She was a poor widow. She was living in a foreign land away from her birth family. If that's you, you maybe know, you probably know what that feels like. But you see, God saw her as an important as, as important and his plan for her life culminated in her becoming part of the lineage of Jesus as the grandmother of King David so even yes even this book it's all it all points to Jesus all of it it points to Jesus you see God's plan typically involves using people who are considered to be underdogs or unimportant or unimpressive from man's perspective. 2 Corinthians 12.9 tells us that his strength is made perfect in our weakness. If you see yourself as someone that is unimportant, there's no big, you know, you're not very good at anything. You're just not good at sports. You're not good at drawing. You're not good at singing. You're not good at, you know. You know God is still impressed by you. He still cares for you. He still sees you as his child. And he's like, yeah, that's my kid. That's my child. That's my daughter. That's my son. The world may not care about you, may not, you know, give you a, you know, much attention, but God will. He's paying attention to you. Again, even if you're not really good at anything, again, His strength is made perfect in our weakness. Fourth application, God uses little things to accomplish great plans. What an amazing plan God had for a series of little things that all added up to important pieces of God's big plan. See, God intended for Ruth to be a part of the story in the lineage of Jesus. So he pulled together events such as the famine, Naomi's relocation to Moab, their return to Bethlehem, Bo Boaz's bloodline, and many, many other events just to ensure that Ruth could be part of his plan. And God does that same thing in our lives today. The way I see it, the way I describe it is, things I'm praying about, things I'm hoping for, and things I'm asking 
the Lord for in regards to all of you, in regards to the church. He may not be answering them right here or right now at this very moment, but I know he's working in the background, just as he was Naomi and her situation. All these little events, all these little things had to come together in order for eventually Jesus to be born from that family. Well, like I said, he's working things out in the background for you. You may not see it, you may not get it, you may not understand it, you just have to be patient. He doesn't stop and just kick back and just wait for things to happen. No, he's not like that. He is working constantly. And what's mind-boggling, what's mind-blowing is that even with wicked people, with evil people, heathens, non-Christians, he's working situations in their lives so that you can be blessed. You heard that story in the Bible about that judge, that wicked judge, we just had that lady, I'm, I'm paraphrasing the story, but the lady kept constantly coming to him and badgering him, bothering him, and eventually, like, he was like, oh, man, I've had enough. All right, get what you want. And he's doing things in the background. All right, um, God has a redeemer in place who can rescue us from the devastation of our own sin. God has a redeemer for our lives too. You know what his name is? His name is Jesus. Boaz was a type, a prophetic symbol of Christ and his redemptive work in our lives today. You see, we're all desolate as a result of our sinful natures. We're all, we, uh, we are empty, just as Naomi was empty and devastated after she had lost everything and had returned to Judah. Our sin has rendered us empty and, desert, and desolate spiritually. But you see, Jesus is willing to redeem us. Jesus is willing to redeem you. He wants to rescue you from the penalty of your sin. And all you have to do to be rescued is to call on Him. It says in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Well, you have a Redeemer, and His name is Jesus, who died on the cross for your sins to forgive you, to save you. And if you're ready for that salvation, if you're ready to call on Him, if you're ready to make Jesus the Lord of your life, I want to invite you to the cross he can bear, just give him all your sins. He will forgive you. If you're ready to do that, if you're ready to call on Jesus today, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head and pray this with all your heart with all sincerity. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I now turn from my sins and confess you. I confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. 
Thank you for forgiving me. And I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born again life. In your name, amen. Friends, if you prayed that, welcome to the family of God. Uh, let us know. Let us know you prayed that. We want to uh, maybe lead you in your next step of the Christian walk. Um, thank you for joining us. I pray that you have a great week. Be blessed wherever you are, you're at. Be a blessing to others. And again, we look forward to seeing you next week. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.